All right, students, today we're going to be talking about chapter one in the textbook. So this is uh, the what and why of statistics chapter. So we will discuss that now. Right. So this chapter opens up talking about why it is that you might be interested in learning statistics. Okay. Now, one of the reasons why you may be interested in learning statistics is that you are consistently being exposed to statistics in your everyday life. Okay. Um, think about, you know, I'm sure you've all seen a commercial recently, you know, four out of five dentists recommend this uh, type of toothpaste over, you know, what, you know, Rembrandt or maybe Colgate saying four out of five dentists recommend this type of toothbrush. Or I think what's a little bit more relevant nowadays is thinking about, you know, this pandemic. Uh, I'm shooting this sometime around uh, summer 2020. Uh, thinking about COVID-19. And of course, you're he consistently hearing new statistical information about how many people have caught the virus, how many people are dying from the virus, how many people of certain age groups are dying from the virus. You know, the, the percentage, you know, the likelihood of you catching you know, the virus being indoors versus being outdoors, right? So these are all statistics that are being thrown out to you, right? And we're consistently being exposed to, to statistical material every day of, of our lives, okay? So since we're consistently being exposed to statistics, you know, if you watch ESPN, you're being exposed to statistics. Um, if you watch the news, if you, you know, watch TV or read a textbook, you're always being exposed to, to statistical material. So it's important that since you're being exposed to this, uh, this information on such a consistent basis, it's important to be able to become a sharper consumer of this type of statistical material when you are presented with this, okay? Another reason why it may be useful for you all is that if you want to be a major in the social sciences, you're going to consistently be expect to, expected to read and interpret statistical information presented to you in the workplace, presented to you, um, you know, in the classroom. As you transfer to the university, you're going to have to read a lot of academic journal articles. And those journal articles a lot of times use a lot of statistical information. So that's two reasons why you might want to learn statistics. So discussing that, well, what, what is statistics, okay? So there's actually two definitions that the textbook throws out. There's this one, and I think they give you another definition in chapter six. Um, when we get to chapter six, we'll talk about that definition of statistics. But for now, just understand statistics as a set of procedures that are used by social scientists. The textbook uses the term social scientists, but the reality is, is that, um, you know, all scientists, you know, uh, use statistics, but, We'll just use this definition. A set of procedures used by social scientists to organize, summarize, and then communicate large amounts of information. So like I said, if you're paying attention to this COVID-19 pandemic, you may notice that in order to organize large, massive amounts of information, you need to use statistical procedures, right? You know, how many people have caught it? How many people are dying? You know, how many people are, you know, they're using statistical models to predict how many think people they think are going to catch it eventually, how many people they think are going to die as a result of this pandemic as well, okay? Now, data is information that we represent with numbers, which can then be the subject of statistical analysis, okay? So data, for the most part, anything that exists out there in the world can be transformed into data, into data okay? Um, wh what do I mean by that? So if we're thinking about um, health, well, there, well, even something subjective like health, we could represent numerically, okay? So, for example, let's just say we're thinking about health and we're thinking about blood pressure, okay? Something subjective like health could be, that can be represented by, you know, your, your, your blood pressure. You think about maybe perhaps even your body mass index, you know, your height to your weight ratio um, could be one way that we could represent your health numerically. We could look at your cholesterol counts. Um, so something subjective like health could be represented numerically. And I tell people all the time that pretty much anything that exists out there, we can represent numerically. If we want to take something like, uh, you know, eye color, we could represent that numerically. Okay? We could assign people with brown eyes, one, people with blue eyes, two, people with 
hazel eyes, three, and so on, and so on and so forth. Okay, hair colors, same thing. Um, we can look at something like you know standings in you know let's just say the playoff. Let's just say the NBA playoffs. Okay, right now as I'm shooting this, this is uh, 2020. They they might open back up the season NBA season soon, and uh, the Milwaukee Bucks are currently the number one seed in the playoffs. Okay. Los Angeles Lakers would be number two. I think Toronto Raptors would three, be three. Los Angeles Clippers would be four. So that's another thing, you know, standings could be represented numerically. So pretty much anything that you can think of that exists out there in the world could be transformed into data. We can represent it numerically. It could be the subject of statistical analysis. Okay. So what we're going to be learning is what we refer to as the research process in this class. Okay. Now, the research process usually entails five different things that you need to do, okay? Now, this is standard amongst all disciplines if you're doing quantitative or statistical research. Um, most research projects follow these five steps, okay? Now, the first thing that you want to do is you want to ask an interesting research question, okay? So, the first thing is to ask the research question. Now, I tell people all the time, when you are asking a research question and you think about starting a research study, you want to do something that you think is interesting. Now, why do you want to do something that you think is interesting? The reason why you want to do something that you think is interesting is I've had a lot of people that I've known, friends, colleagues, start a research project and they thought it was boring, so they never ended up finishing it. Okay, so you're much more likely to finish a research project when you have an interesting topic or an interesting subject. Okay, so start off with asking a research question, have a research topic that you're interested in. Like I said, you know, I'm sure everybody's interested in COVID-19 right now, so that might be something that people would want to study. Okay, you know, maybe what factors lead to people dying from COVID-19, what factors lead to people, you know, surviving. You know, what, what factors lead to people catching the virus to begin with, okay? So these would all be things that I think would be, you know, interesting right now, okay? So after you have a research question, typically what you would do at this point is you would do something we refer to as a literature review. So what is a literature review, okay? Now, a literature review is where you go search academic journals, okay? So we, we check peer-reviewed journal articles to see what other experts in the field have said about this particular topic and this particular subject. Okay, now the example of COVID-19 is relatively recent, relatively new. Peer-reviewed journal articles usually take months to get published, so I'm not sure if there's a lot of like good studies on this disease, but obviously there are studies on other types of pandemics, you know, influenza and other coronavirus types diseases as well. So you could probably find something, okay. But first you want to ask a research question, you know, what, what is it that you want to look at? The second thing you're going to do is do a literature review, and you typically want to get literature and academic journal articles that have been published within the past decade, okay? Now, why do you want academic journal articles that were published in the past decade? One, because like I said, uh, with academic journal articles, they're reviewed by other peers, which who are other professors, who are other experts in the field who study this same phenomenon, okay? So you know that you're getting high quality. The second thing, the reason why you want to have it done within the past 10 years, you really don't want to go back further than 20 years because knowledge or what we understand as knowledge okay, from research is consistently changing and evolving. Okay? You go back and look at uh, you know, medical journals from 150 years ago, the type of crazy stuff that they say in those is, is, is shocking. Okay? So you never use an academic journal article from 150 years ago to, you know, try to understand disease today, okay? They really didn't understand things like viruses and germ theory back then, so there'd be no reason for you to go back that far. So you'd always want to look at, like, research published within the past decade. And like I said, you probably don't want to go back further than 20 years, okay? Um, so after you study what other professors and what other experts in the field have said about the relationship, then you're going to formulate a hypothesis based upon that information that you've learned from those previous professors. Now, sometimes you may actually make the argument that those other professors, they've missed something relevant and that their research is all wrong. Okay. 
good luck trying to get that study published because uh, like I said, these people are probably going to be the people reviewing your uh, article, but you know, maybe you say, okay, well, everybody thinks that this is the one thing that's causing it and you believe that there's something else that all these other professors are missing and you might want to say, okay, well, these, this is my hypothesis. You know, I, I believe this hypothesis because this is something that everybody else missed. So let's just say that I, I instead of studying uh, COVID-19, let's just say I want to look at the relationship between social class and health. Okay? So I want to know, does your social class influence your health? And that could actually be related to COVID-19. You know, does social class, does an increase in social class have protective factors against, you know, maybe catching COVID-19? Okay. So that would be the kind of like the question that I'm interested in. I look at the data and I see, you know, overwhelmingly that the literature says that people from upper social classes tend to have better health outcomes, you know, and there's, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons for that. Okay, well, I would formulate a hypothesis based upon what they said. Now, like I said, maybe they all say that people from the upper class have better health outcomes, and then I, for whatever reason, think that everybody's missed something relevant, and I think that for some, for some reason, I think that people from the lower social class have better health outcomes. Okay? Well, I could have that as my hypothesis. So my hypothesis would be something like people from a lower social class have better health outcomes. And then obviously, if you're from a lower social class, maybe you have more protective factors against COVID-19. Now, I personally would never say that. I'm just saying that this is something that you could do. But typically, it's the case that you read an academic journal article, you look at the literature review and look at the studies that have been done prior, and then you, a lot of times, uh, to some degree, kind of test a similar hypothesis, but you look for what they might be missing, okay, and you try to improve upon their research. So like I said, because COVID-19 is so new, there hasn't been a lot of studies done on it, okay, or at least any legitimate peer-reviewed academic studies that have gone through the peer review process that have been done on it before. But like I said, there's been a lot of studies done on other coronaviruses and other types of influenza type uh, pandemics. So uh, you might say, okay, well, I'm looking at this new strain of coronavirus and I wanna study you know, what type of factors protect against this. Okay? So maybe my hypothesis, so let's just say I have a hypothesis. I had this research question of what type of factors lead to or prevent people from getting the coronavirus. And then I come up with a hypothesis and my hypothesis is something like, Social class, and we're going to get into independent variables and dependent variables coming up. But so my independent variable would be social class. And what do I mean by social class? I mean whether or not you're lower, middle, or upper class. Um, influences the dependent variable. We'll talk about what a dependent variable is later. Influences the dependent variable, which is catching COVID-19 or dying from COVID-19. Okay, so I, I believe that there's a link here. And then I believe that I would have a direction with this hypothesis. And we'll talk about what a directional research hypothesis is coming up. So I might say something that as your social class increases, okay, you're less likely to die from COVID-19. Maybe you have health insurance, right? Uh, maybe you just have like a healthier lifestyle because you have more money, you can buy healthier food, okay? So then I, after I have a research question, I then formulate a hypothesis, okay? And after I come up with a hypothesis, at this point, I need to collect data, okay? So I can't just say this and then, all right, end of the study, I'm right, you're wrong. No, so then we have to actually go about getting that data to confirm whether or not my original hypothesis was accurate or not. Okay. Now, how do you go about collecting data? Well, there's a couple different ways. One way you could do that is you could pull data from the government. Okay. So CDC will be tracking stuff. And a lot of other uh, government agencies will be tracking this type of information. States will be tracking this type of information. Um, or you could actually go about doing a study yourself. Okay, you could send out a survey, um, you know, call people on the phone, things like that. Um, that would obviously be the much more difficult way to do that. Since the state is already being collected, you would in all likelihood just pull the data from the Center for Disease Control, which, uh, you know, that, that stuff is all just up online for people. Um, this is just one example of how you'd go about collecting data, but let's just say you wanted to look at the relationship between, you know, uh, just say you wanted to look at 
maybe the dependent variables graduation rates and then you want to look at how um, going to preschool might influence college graduation rates okay well that information you might actually have to create yourself so you might have to go about doing a survey to, to collect that data so there are different ways to collect data sometimes you can just pull it from um, a governmental agency or another researcher who's published this information for you but but if that's not the case and it's not that easy then you might actually have to go about doing a survey and go about collecting that data yourself okay now the third process in, in this research process process is to go about analyzing the data so that's what this whole class is going to be about okay we're going to learn how to analyze data for the purpose of testing a hypothesis okay so that's what we'll be learning about in this class. So all these next 11 chapters will be about that process. Then what you do is you evaluate your hypothesis, your original hypothesis. Was your hypothesis correct? Was it incorrect? Is there some evidence for your hypothesis? Is there no evidence for your hypothesis? And then you contribute this evidence and this information to the literature review. So then other researchers in the future can take this and then progress that information forward. All right, so when you're doing a hypothesis and you're asking a interesting question that you want to do a study on, you want to make sure that it is what we refer to as an empirical research question, okay? Now, what is an empirical research question? So let's talk a little about the theory of empiricism. So empiricism is a theory of knowledge that essentially states that everything that we know, and everything that we could ever know, needs to be able to be verified with our direct sensory experiences, okay? What are our senses? Touch, taste, smell, um, hearing, and seeing. Okay. Now, if we cannot confirm this with our direct sensory experiences, then um, you know what you're dabbling in philosophy or religion or theology, not not uh, empiricism. Okay. So th the idea of empiricism is is that our research is based on information that can be verified by using our direct sensory experience okay so we can't rely on things like reasoning or speculation or moral judgment or subjective preference okay now what do i mean by that so if i were to say are women if i were to throw out this uh, empirical research question are women paid less than men for the same types of work now is this something that i could verify with my direct sensory experience of course i could I could again pull data. Maybe I have access to the pay rates for, let's just say, COD faculty who are women and COD faculty who are men, and I could compare the two. So I could verify it directly. Okay, but that would of course just be a COD. I could of course do this nationally, and a lot of studies have been done nationally comparing the wages that women make compared to the wages that men make, and men on average tend to make more. Now, typically, it's not the case for the exact same type of work, but on average, men make more than women. Okay? Now, what is not an example of an empirical research question? Something like, does God exist? Okay? Now, why is that not an empirical research question? Because it's not something that we could ever really verify with our direct sensory experience. Okay? You can't touch, taste, smell, hear God. Um, so that's not an empirical research question. Asking something like, is pizza better than tacos? That's not an empirical research question because that's really more relying on subjective preference, okay? Um, so that's not an example of an empirical research question. What is an example of an empirical research question is, do, does my class or do your peers in the class, do they prefer pizza over tacos? Now, can that be verified with your direct experience? Yes, you can ask people. You know, you could say, how many people prefer pizza over tacos? See how many people raise your hand, okay? And then you can see how many people prefer uh, tacos over pizza, and then see how many people raise your hand. And that's something that we can verify empirically, okay? So when we say that we want to do an empirical research question, it's something that we need to be able to verify with our direct sensory experiences. And like I said, it can't be something like moral judgment, you know, subjective preference. It can't be philosophy. It can't be something that we can't actually test. Okay, we need to be able to test it with our sensory experiences. And if not our direct sensory experiences, it needs to be something that we can test with like some type of instrument. What do I mean by like that? Well, I can't see the Andromeda galaxy with my eyeballs. 
so I can't see it. Okay, but there's a tele. Well, we have telescopes that can see the Andromeda galaxy, so I can then, uh, you know, verify that the Androm Andromeda galaxy exists by using a telescope and by using my sensor experiences through that telescope. Okay, so that's uh, the idea of empiricism. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about theory. So what is a theory? There's a couple of different definitions of theories. And if you take one research method class over another, or you go into a different discipline, they'll have different like definitions, but the general idea is the same. Okay. So a theory is an explanation of the relationship between two or more individual observable attributes of individuals or groups. So what does that mean? It's essentially an explanation as to how and why things are related. Dave. So, for example, going back to the whole concept of, you know, men and women and then their wages, you might ask yourself, well, why is it that men make more than women? Well, and I'm sure that there's a lot of theories about that. Uh, I'm just going to throw out a couple. Some people would make the argument, and some people believe, and this is an explanation as, as to why this is the case, that men are more competitive. Okay, that there's this kind of like expectation that men be breadwinners, okay? And there's an expectation within our culture that women are more nurturing, okay? And because of that, there's a strong expectation and a strong desire for men to go about achieving this breadwinning role and therefore are, tend to be more competitive in the job market, okay? Um, that's just one theory, okay? Uh, another theory might state that women, because of the fact, again, because of our culture's ideas about gender, women are more likely to stay at home and raise children while men are in the workforce. Um, obviously, when they get pregnant, they have maternity leave. So that all those years of you know, perhaps staying home with young children, nursing might play a role in men proceeding up the maybe like a corporate ladder or maybe just having more experience on the job than women. okay and then you know another theory might just be downright discrimination now that's of course hard to prove because it's rare that a man will just come out and say that i i'm not hiring women because they're women or women are worse at this job but of course that that's a reality within our culture that's a reality in our world that you know women do face uh, ex uh discrimination and that has uh, a lot to do with why women make less than men as well. Not the whole reason, okay? Just like the first two explanations and the first two theories were not the whole reason. There's a, probably a couple of different reasons why men on average make more than women do. Okay, so th these would be theories. This would be an explanation as to why this relationship between these two, what we refer to as variables, exist, okay? So let's talk, let's go back to a little bit about a hypothesis, because we talked about that. We have a hypothesis up here. We had a hypothesis that you know men make more than women. Okay. Let's talk about what is a hypothesis. Okay, so a hypothesis is a statement about the relationship between two characteristic, two or more characteristics that we refer to as variables. Okay, now I have two variables up here. Social class as my independent variable, and then you know, dying from COVID-19 as my dependent variable. Okay. So those are two variables. Um, so, but before we talk about a hypothesis, we first kind of need to talk about what a variable is. So a variable. A variable is a property of people or objects that can take on two or more values. Okay. Now, pretty much just like I said, anything that exists in the world can be transformed into data. Anything can be uh, a variable. So for example, we talked about how social class is a variable. Okay. It can be lower, middle, upper, and of course, depending on you know how the researcher might define it, you might have the chronically homeless, the working poor, the lower middles, the middle middles, the upper middles, you know, the super rich, the upper middle class, you know, the blue bloods, and then the working rich. Um, so I'm sure you can define social class in, many, in various different ways, but one thing that makes something a variable is that there's at least two values. And what we mean by two values, there's at least two categories. So if we think about social class, let's just say that I'm just saying there's three, just for simplicity's sake. Let's just say that there are three variables. Okay. 
So there are three categories. Okay, let's just say that there are the class, there's upper, middle, and then lower. Let's just say for the variable sex. Okay, again, I'm sure there, there can be more, but I'm just using this for simplicity sake. I want to say sex, but there's no biological sex. Let's say that there's females and then there's males. Okay, so there's two categories. Um, I, I don't know, religion. Again, I mean, how many religions are out there? There's quite a few. Okay, so I'm just going to like probably narrow it down to like a couple. Okay, let's say Christianity. Islam, and then let's just say Hinduism. Okay, so that, that's, that's just three, right? I'm sure there's like 300 religions, but I'm not going to list them all because it's going to take too long. Yeah. Um, so these are all examples of variables. They're properties of people or objects that can take on two or more values. Like I said, pretty much anything that you think that exists out there in the world could be co considered a variable. You know, like I said, hair color, eye shape, skin color, social class, your age, how much do you make, what type of job you have. These are all examples, you know, what, what clothing brand do you wear? They, these are all examples of variables. Okay, and when you create a hypothesis, you need at least two variables, okay? Now, a hypothesis is a statement about the relationship between two or more variables. So again, our last example, we were talking about how your social class could influence whether or not you die of COVID-19, right? Now, um, dying of COVID-19, really, there's kind of like two categories to that. Either you died or you survived, right? Um, Obviously, your social class, like I said, let's just say we're saying there's three, right? So we would say that a statement about the relationship between the two variables, we would say something like, as your social class increases, your likelihood of dying from COVID-19 decreases. Okay, so that's a hypothesis. That's what we refer to as a directional research hypothesis because I'm specifying direction. Okay, now I could have a non-directional research hypothesis in the sense that I believe that your social class influences whether or not you die from COVID-19 or not, but I'm not specifying whether or not people from the upper class or from the lower class are more likely to die. I'm just saying that there's a difference between the social classes. So in that sense, we would have a non-directional research hypothesis. Okay? So what you're doing with the hypothesis is you're making a statement about the relationship between these two variables. So to kind of illustrate this a little bit more, because I see this a lot in class, that is, students don't tend to understand the difference between a research question, which we were talking about was the first thing that you do, and a, uh, what we refer to as a hypothesis. So a research question ends with a question mark. So question could be something like, does your class influence Uh, death rates from COVID-19. Okay, so that would be like your research question, and it ends with a question mark. And then your hypothesis, you're going to make a statement about the relationship between the two variables, and then you go about testing that hypothesis, okay? So your hypothesis might be something like, Again, if I'm using a directional research hypothesis, um, people from the upper class are less likely, let's just say less likely, that's what I would believe, to die. from COVID-19. So this is gonna end with a period, okay? So now I can go about testing this statement. I can go about testing this hypothesis, okay? 
Here I'm asking a question, which is my research question. Here I'm stating a hypothesis, which is a statement which I'm going to go about testing. Okay, so that's what a hypothesis is, a statement, okay? Like I said, we talked about variables, the property of people or objects that can take on two or more valuable values. Anything that exists out there, we, we can transform into a variable, just like anything that exists in the world, we could, uh, you know, transform into data, okay? So let's talk a little bit about units of analysis. So what is a unit of analysis? It's the level of social life on which a social scientist focuses on. So for example, if we want to look at like murder rates in a city, well then the unit of analysis is the city, okay? If we want to look at, um, you know, let's just say death rates from COVID-19, the unit of analysis is going to be, um, you know, at least if we're looking at it nationwide, the unit of analysis in this situation would be, you know, nation states, okay? We wanted to know uh, which uh, type of family structure is most likely to produce college graduates, you know, whether or not that be single parent households or, you know, uh, the, what would be referred to as like the nuclear, nuclear family. Um, well, with the, both the mother and the father, well then we could be looking at families, right? If we're looking at graduation rates for College of the Desert, well then in that situation, we're looking at the organization of College of the Desert. So our unit of analysis would be organization. So when we're studying, um, or maybe we're looking at, you know, certain types of like, you know, things that you would do to lose weight, well then in that situation, the unit of analysis would be individual. So, Within the discipline of sociology or within the social sciences in general, tends, the types of research projects that we can do are, tend to be pretty broad. So we can study everything from you know, groups, like let's just say you want to study like a sports team, to you know, an organization such as police departments or fire departments or you know, a, a college, a university, an elementary school, to where you can study a city, you can study Palm Desert, you can study Los Angeles, you know, you can study Chicago, to the point where we can also study the nation states, okay? So that's what we refer to as the unit of analysis. It's the level of social life which the social scientist focuses on, okay? All right, so let's get back to variables. So we talked about what a variable is. Let's talk about the difference between an independent variable and a dependent variable. So the dependent variable is the variable to be explained. Okay, that's what we're interested in. That's what we're focused on. And then the independent variable is the variable that we believe influences the dependent variable. So in our example with class and COVID-19, the independent variable is social class. Okay, because we believe that your social class will influence whether or not you die from COVID-19. Okay. Let's just say that I'm looking at the relationship. To say I have, I have a hypothesis that says that people who study more are going to get better grades on, the, on their exams. Well, of course, in the, that example, our independent variable is how much time you spend studying, okay? And then your dependent variable are your grades, okay? Or your independent variable is to say, say in homework your grades, the more you do your homework and the more time you spend on your homework, the better your grades. So your independent variable is your homework, dependent variable is your grades, okay? Or let's just say we're talking about, we have a hypothesis about weight loss. We're saying that the less you eat, the less you weigh. The independent variable in that situation is how much do you eat? And the dependent variable in that situation is how much do you weigh, okay? So the independent variable influences the dependent variable. Okay, so in, in this example, independent and dependent variables, just say individuals with postgraduate postgraduate education, and what does postgraduate education mean? It means like a master's degree or an MBA or a doctorate degree, uh, you know, a juris doctorate, you know, medical degree. Um, um, so people with postgraduate education are less likely to have, are likely to have fewer children than those with less education, okay? In this situation, your education level is the independent variable, okay? And as that goes up, 
the amount of children you have, the dependent variable goes down according to this hypothesis, okay? Um, so the independent variable is your education level, dependent variable in this situation would be the number of children you have. Um, we already talked about some of this stuff. So again, the dependent variable is the uh, variable that we're trying to explain. The independent variable usually influences the dependent variable. So the independent variable is often seen as the influencing directly or indi indirectly the dependent variable. And of course, this slide also says that the independent variable usually occurs earlier in time than the dependent variable. And of course, that's the case because you can't say that, you know, this variable influences this variable if this variable comes before this variable, right? So that's what that uh, bullet point means. All right. Now, like I said, pretty much anything that exists out there, we can transform into data. We can transform into a variable. But not all variables are created equally. Okay, now that brings us to this concept of the levels of measurement. All right, so this brings us to this whole concept of the levels of measurement. Because like I said, you know, even though everything that exists in the world can be transformed into a variable, all variables are not created equal, okay? And this is relevant to understanding statistics because the type of, we're gonna learn about a lot of statistical procedures in this class. Now, the reason why this is important is because the type of statistical procedure that you can use to analyze the data and to, you know, test your research hypothesis is going to be dependent on the type of variable you have and how that variable is measured, okay? So, so not every operation can be used with every type of variable, okay? You're going to learn about a lot of them in, these class, in, in this class, but again, you don't want to start mixing up this, uh, this procedure with this type of data because it's not going to work like that, okay? That, that's not the way statistics work, okay? So the type of statistical operation that we use, again, depends on how our variables are measured. Okay. Now, there are four levels of measurement. Um, the book only talks about three because the last two, which are referred to as interval ratio, um, for the purposes of studying, doing research in the social sciences, interval and ratio are pretty much the same thing. But in other disciplines, um, you know, the, the distinction can be relevant sometimes. Okay. So let's talk about the first level of measurement. Now, the first level of measurement is what we refer to as nominal level of measurement. Okay, so with a nominal level of measurement, we have numbers or other symbols are assigned to a set of categories for the purpose of naming, labeling, or classifying the observation. So there's a clear qualitative difference between the categories of a variable, but there's no quantitative difference between the categories of the variable, okay? So the way you know whether or not one variable is nominal or what we're going to talk about up, coming up, ordinal or interval ratio, is by looking at the categories of the variable. Okay. Now, with nominal level measurement, there's a qualitative difference between the categories of the variable, but there is no clear quantitative difference between the categories. And what we mean by that, there's no logical rank to the categories of the variable. So to illustrate this a little bit more, let's just talk about a nominal variable. So a good example of a nominal variable is something we talked about a little bit earlier, which is religion. Now, religion is a nominal variable. I put religion. Now, I'm just gonna throw out a couple of them. One thing I can think about is Christianity. And by Christianity, I'm gonna just gonna throw them all out, which is Christianity, Catholicism, you know, um, any other type of, uh, you know, Baptist, any other type of Christian denomination you can think of. I'm just going to lump it all into Christianity. We have Christianity. Let's just say we have Buddhism. Um, and maybe Hinduism. Um, Judaism. Islam, um, atheism, 
and ag agnostic. And then people who consider themselves to be agnostic. Okay. Now, there's a clear difference, quali quality of difference between these categories, right? There's a difference between a Christian and a Buddhist. There's a difference between a Buddhist and a Jew. There's a difference between a Jew and a, somebody who's atheist. And there's even a difference between somebody who's atheist and agnostic. If you don't know what the difference between atheist and agnostic is, atheists say God doesn't exist. Agnostic says, I don't know, maybe. You know, I don't know, right? So, um, you know, there, there's clear differences between these categories of the variable, but there's no logical rank to these categories. You know, um, should I, is there any logical reason for Christianity to be at the top? Other than it's just the first one that came into my mind? No. Is there any reason for agnostics to be at the bottom other than the fact that I just popped into my head at the last second. There's no reason for the Jews to be in the middle or the Hindus to be in the middle or the Jews to be above the Islam. So there's no logical rank to these categories. I could just as easily put, you know, the atheists at the top and then the Christians at, down here or the Jews up at the top or the Muslims at the top or down here. So there's no logical rank to these categories. Another example would be, let's just say something like pets. You know, what, what type of pets are out there? Lizards, snakes, dogs. I guess some people have them, tigers as pets too. Um, so these are all examples of, I guess, pets that people have, that people take care of, right? I'm sure there's more, I mean, like cats, right? And pretty common pet. Um, is there any reason for me to put the lizards at the top and the cats at the bottom, dogs in the middle? No, right? So there's no logical order to the categories of this variable, right? So when we think about religions, pets, other examples of nominal level data like hair color. Is there any reason why people with blue hair I'm assuming they dye their hair if they have blue hair, should be above or last or before people with brunette hair or blonde hair or redheads. No, so those would all be examples of nominal level data, right? Your gender, nominal. Race, nominal. Um, you know, you might think that maybe men should be on top and women should be on the bottom, but of course that's just your bigoted opinion. Maybe you think that white people should be above other racial groups. You're a racist again. Um, so again, that's just uh, kind of like more opinion, right? So if I was thinking about the different types of food, right? And we're saying, you know, we have Mexican and Japanese soul food, you know, just American food. And kind of just loosely defining as like maybe hot dogs and hamburgers or something like that, French fries. Um, again, this is nominal level data, right? There's no reason why Mexican food should be on top, American food should be on the bottom, soul food should be in the middle. So these are all examples of nominal level data where there's a clear difference between the categories. There's a clear difference between Mexican food and Japanese food. Um, but there is no logical order or logical ranks to the categories of nominal level variables. Okay. Now, there's also what we refer to as ordinal level variables. Now, with ordinal level variables, this is another situation where you have a clear qualitative difference between the categories of a variable, but no, but there is a quantitative in the sense that there's a logical rank to the category. So with ordinal level variables, we can actually order the categories from lowest to high in a logical way. Okay. So that's a step above nominal level data. So examples of ordinal level data, example of ordinal level variable would be something like what we already talked about, social class. Because not only would we have a difference between the categories, 
Well, we can also logically rank them. So for example, we talk about upper, middle, lower, right? Example of uh, the different categories of social class. Not only is there a qualitative difference between people who live in the upper class versus people who live in the middle class, but we'd also know that somebody from the upper class they tend to have more income, more wealth, uh, tend to have more job prestige and higher education level than people from the middle class, and certainly than people from the lower class. Okay. Another example would be looking at something like degree. Okay. So degree. You know, we know the PhD is higher than a master's, so doctorate. Doctorate degree is going to be higher than a master's. I put PhD or doctorate because there's a lot of doctorate type degrees. They're not all PhDs, they're not all medical degrees. There's juris doctorate, which means you're essentially a lawyer. Um, so the other education doctorate, which means you're a professor of education. So there are different types of uh, doctorate degrees. Um, doctorate, masters, we know doctorate's above masters, right? We know masters above bachelors. And we know bachelors is above associates and so on. And of course, associates above just a high school diploma. So in this situation, not only do we have a qualitative difference between the categories, but there's also a logical rank and a logical order to them, okay? Um, another example of like an ordinal level variable would be looking at something like the Likert scale. If you're like, what is the Likert scale? You've all seen it before. Um, it's asking maybe like your attitudes or your feelings about something. So let's just say I say, what are your thoughts on Trump's handling of the pandemic? And, you know, to say that you asking about, do you think he's handling it right? Statement is Trump, you know, had the right response. And then there's strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. With those categories, there's a clear rank to the categories. So that variable, which would be, you know, looking at, you know, your approval of his job of handling this, would be an example of ordinal level data. Okay. Now the last one, before we continue on with not discussing ordinal anymore, is interval ratio. So with interval ratio level data, um, we have categories are not only ranked, so similar to ordinal level data in the sense that the categories are ranked in a logical way, okay? but we can also measure the distance or the difference between each category. Um, with um, Ratio level data, there's also a natural zero point. So if you're, I, I, I discussed that there's four. There's a difference between interval and ratio. With interval, what's the difference between interval and ratio? Interval, there's no natural zero point. With ratio, there is a natural zero point. So the vast majority of variables that you would see are ratio. The only thing that I can really think of with like an interval level measurement would be something like the Fahrenheit scale where there's no natural zero point. I mean, there's a zero in the Fahrenheit scale, but it isn't, there's, it's not a natural zero in the sense that like, well, what, what, what does zero mean? It's just another temperature, right? I mean, it's not even like the freezing point, right? So the freezing point of water in the Fahrenheit scale is like 32 degrees. Um, the boiling point is of water, like 212. Uh, so the Fahrenheit scale, like, the zero doesn't mean anything really. It's just another temperature. Okay. Um, so uh, with the Fahrenheit scale, that's an example of interval level data and uh, everything else that you can think of would be ratio. So that's why we don't really distinguish or difference between the two. Um, but there is technically a difference. So with ratio level data, there is a natural zero point. You'll, you'll never be tested on it, so don't worry about that. But in case you're wondering, okay. So like I said, with interval ratio, we just put them together. With interval ratio level data, not only is there a logical rank to the categories, but we can also measure the distance and the difference between the different categories of the variable as well. So a good example of interval ratio level data would be something like age. So for example, let's just say that we know that somebody is 22 years old, okay? And then we also know that another person is 
44 years old, okay? So not only do we know that the person, so let's just say we have these age categories, the person who's 44 is older than the person who's 22, but we can also measure the distance between their age in the sense that we know that the person who's 44 is exactly 22 years older than the 22 year old, okay? 44 year old is twice the 22 year old's age, okay? Another example of interval ratio level data would be something like income. So let's just say that we know somebody makes $100,000 a year. And then we know another person makes $25,000 a year, okay? So not only do we know that the person in the $100,000 a year category makes more than the person in the $25,000 a year category, so there's logical rank to the categories, but we can also measure the distance or the difference in the sense that we know that the person who makes $100,000 makes exactly $75,000 more than the person who uh, makes $25,000. Now, that's, of course, different than looking at an ordinal level variable, which is looking at something like degree, okay? So, for example, we know that somebody who has a PhD usually has more schooling than somebody with a master's degree, but we don't know how much more schooling, right? You know, this is a community college. And I spent six years at a community college. So, um, and some of you probably, you know, are super seniors as well. You know, been here for six years and still here. I was the same way. I'm not, you know, not saying anything bad about that. You know, people take different journeys. Um, but we can't necessarily measure the difference between somebody with like an associate's degree and a bachelor's. We know that the bachelor's higher, they have more schooling, but how much more schooling? Somebody who has an associate's might have spent two years, or maybe they finished it really fast, got their associates in a year and a half, or somebody with a bachelor's may have taken 15 years to uh, complete their bachelor's. I know people who, do, who worked on their PhD for 25 years, okay? I know people who've been working on their PhD for 20 years and still haven't finished. And when I mean that they've been working on their PhD for 20 years, they've been working on their PhD for 20 years. Really doesn't take you that long to write a dissertation, but and it took me three years. Um, why? Because I spent six, year, six months writing it and two and a half years doing anything that I could do to avoid writing it. Um, so then that's just common. It's kind of difficult to, when you get to that point to just write a book on your own. Um, so, well, thinking back to degree, right, we know somebody with a PhD has a higher level of education, but we don't know how much more, how many more years of education. So we can't measure the distance, right? If I tell you somebody's from the upper class, we know that in general that person has more wealth than somebody from the middle class. It probably has a higher income than somebody from the middle class, but how much more income? How much more wealth? We don't know that. We, we can't measure the difference between the, the difference between the upper class and then the middle class but I can measure the difference between somebody who has $100,000 versus somebody who has $50,000, okay? I can measure the, diff the distance and the difference between somebody who's 50 years old and somebody who's 20 years old. I know this 50 year old is exactly 30 years older than the 20 year old, okay? So with interval ratio level data, not only is there a logical rank to the category, but you can measure the distance between the categories as well. With nominal level data, there's no logical rank to any of the categories. Um, there's a qualitative difference between the categories, but there's no logical rank. So the way you can kind of tell whether or not the data that you have is nominal, ordinal, or interval ratio is by looking at the categories. Is there a rank? Okay. Then at the very minimum, you have ordinal. If there is no logical rank to the categories, then you have nominal level, nominal level data. If there's a rank and you can measure the distance in some logical way, then it makes sense that it's interval ratio, okay? Now, a lot of people think that if you have interval ratio level data, that means you have numbers, right? So, you know, looking at something like age, we have one, two, three, four, five, you know, you can be one, two, three, year, four years, five years old, and, you know, it could go all the way up to like probably 110, but I'm not going to write all that, okay? So people think, well, if you have numbers, that means it's interval ratio. But it's not quite that simple because let's just talk about, just say we're looking at standings. What do I mean by standings? Just, just jump back to that example I think I was using a little bit earlier with the NBA playoffs, okay? 
as of writing this, which things always change, the NBA playoffs, how, how would the seating be? I'm a big basketball fan, so that's one of the reasons why I always return back to the NBA. You could, same thing would be applicable to football or hockey or baseball or any other sport. Okay, so we're talking about NBA seating. Okay, now the Bucks would be number one. The Bucks would be number one. Two would be the Lakers. Three would be the Raptors. And four would be the Clippers. Okay. So we know that the Bucks are higher than the Lakers in, 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 in seating sense. But the reason why, even though we have numbers here, we don't have interval ratio level data because we know that the Bucks have a better record. But how much of a better record do they have than the Lakers? Okay, I think the Lakers are only two games back from the Bucks. Okay, um, so you might say to yourself, okay, we can measure the distance. Well, if I have their records, I can measure the distance. But if I'm just looking at seating, I'm just looking at NBA seating. Well, I can't measure the distance just based on the seating. Because maybe it's the case that the Lakers are two games behind the Bucks, but then the Raptors are 10 games behind the Lakers. Okay. So if I just have the seating, I can't measure the distance between you know the, the, the teams. But if I have the records and I know that the Lakers are two games back, and then the uh, Raptors are five games back, and then the Clippers are seven games back. Well, then, then I could actually measure the distance. So in that situation, if I had their records, then I could measure the distance and we would have interval ratio level data. Another example of this, you know, how you can't always just take numbers and then, uh, you know, use the numbers to determine, to, to claim that it's interval ratio. But for example, let's just say that there's this Olympic race, okay? and then we have three people running in the race, we have Usain Bolt, Michael Johnson, and then Carl Lewis. I, I don't think any of them are current runners anymore, but they're kind of like three most famous sprinters that I can think of. Okay, so there's a race. Okay, Usain Bolt gets number one. Michael Johnson gets number two. I'm just going to put MJ for Michael Johnson. And then three, CW, CCL, Carl Lewis. Carl Lewis gets third spot, okay? Now, we have ordinal level data, but we don't have interval ratio. Because even though I know that Usain got one, so he won the race, Michael, jo Michael Johnson came in two, then Carl Lewis came in three, I can't measure the distance. Unless, of course, I knew that Usain Bolt finished the race in 9.5 seconds, Michael Johnson finished in 9.75, and then Carl Lewis finished the race in 10 seconds. Then in this situation, I have interval ratio level data. With this, if I just know, you know what place they finish, then I just have ordinal level data. Hopefully uh, that makes sense to you all. Okay, now, um, let's talk a little bit about discrete versus continuous variable. So a discrete variable, it, this is, only applies to interval ratio level data. So a discrete variable has a minimum size unit of measurement that cannot be subdivided. So this only applies to interval ratio. So if you have normal or ordinal level data, there's no discrete versus continuous. So we have interval ratio level data. There's discrete and then there's continuous. Okay, so discrete would be looking at like the number of children that you have, so number of kids. So this is where you have a minimum size unit of measurement that cannot be subdivided. So number of children, you can't have 2.5 children, the number of pets you have, the number of cars you have, the number of women who work with you versus the number of men who work with you. There are not 2.8 men, you don't have 3.4 pets, 
you don't have 6.9 cars, okay? So those are examples of discrete interval ratio level variables, okay? So things like the number of children, the number of pets you have, the number of cars, how many women in your workplace, things like that. Those are all examples of discrete variables. Now with a continuous variable, continuous interval ratio level variable, you have a situation where it's an interval ratio level variable, okay? But we don't have a minimum size unit of measurement, okay? So the variable can consistently be broken down further and further to increasingly smaller fractional values. So for example, age is a good example of a continuous variable. For example, uh, I'm 34 years old. And so you can say I'm 34 years old. We can also break my age down beyond that into like months, weeks, days, hours, minutes, seconds, milliseconds, and theoretically even further beyond that. Okay. If we look at height, you know, how how tall are you? Let's just say you're five five, five feet five inches. But of course, we could break that down into inches, centimeters, um, you know, and then even further beyond that, right? Distance. Um, so those things like age, uh, height, your, your weight, these are all things that can consistently be broken down further and further and consistently subdivided to increasingly smaller fractional values. Another example of like that would be something like percentages and rates. So percentages, rates, you know, the unemployment rate might, might well, right now it's probably 20%, okay? Um, maybe, but it could be like 20.2%, right? Could be 20.2345%, right? Depending on, you know, how far you want to, you know, if you want to round it all, okay? So, uh, or you can look at like rates or percentages, you know, what percentage of the COD uh, student body graduates, what percentage of students go on to transfer to the university. Maybe it's 12%, maybe it's 12.35% of the student body goes on to transfer and graduate and so on and so forth. So in that sense, you would have continuous level variables, right? Um, with discrete level variable, you have a situation where the, again, you have a minimum size unit of the measurement and it can't be subdivided further and further. You can't cut your pet in half and then say, oh, I have 2.5 dogs, okay? Now, the reason why um, knowing nominal ordinal and interval ratio level data, why this is important, because the type, as we discussed a little bit earlier, the type of statistical procedure that you can do depends on the level of measurement. So, for example, in my opinion, this is kind of like the easiest way to discuss how this works. Really quickly, I'm going to talk about the measure of the central tendency, which is mean, median, and mode. Okay. Now, let's talk about nominal level data. We talked about with nominal level data. An example would be sex. Sex, okay, let's just say we have females versus males. Now, let's just say, what is the mode? The mode is the most frequently occurring, okay? So it's the biggest number. Let's just say that there's 15 women in the class and then 10 men. The modal category is women, okay? Because there's more females than there are men. So if I have nominal level data, or let's just say I, I, I want to know re religious preference, and then I ask a class, you know, a, a class of 25 people, how many people are Christian? And let's just say 20 people raise their hand and say that they're Christian. Well, that's obviously going to be the mode in that situation. So with religion, sex, you know, things like that, we can find the mode. The median is the exact middle of the distribution. Now with nominal level data, you can't find the median. The reason why you can't find the median is because there's no logical rank, so there's no front of the distribution, there's no back, there's no top, there's no bottom, and then the categories in the middle are just randomly placed there. So with nominal level data, you can't find the median. You can find the mode with nominal level data, but you can't find the median. So this is talking about how the different type of data influences the type of procedures that you can use. With nominal level data, I can find the mode. I can't find the median because there's no middle of the distribution because there's no logical rank to the categories of the variable. 
And then mean. What is mean? It is the average. Now, how do you find the average? I'm sure you've all found averages of means before. You take all the numbers, you add them up, and then divide by the total number of cases. Let's just say I'm trying to find the mean religion in a class. Let's just say I say how many people are Christians, 20 people raise their hand are Christian. How many people are atheists? Two people raise their hand. How many people are agnostic? Three people raise their hand. So I got 25 people, 20 Christians, two atheists, three agnostics. How do I find the mean? Do I add the Christians to the agnostics to the atheists and then divide by 25 and then get what? Doesn't make sense, right? So with nominal level data, I can find the mode, but I can only find the mode. Now, let's just say I have ordinal level data. Now, with ordinal level data, let's just say I have, like, let's go back to social class, upper, middle, lower. I ask people to say, how many people are here in lower class? You know, class of 25 people, five people raise their hand. I ask how many people are middle class, and 20 people raise their hand. Okay, well, I can find, I know that the mode is, Middle class, right? Because that's more the most amount of people said that they're middle class. Okay. Can I find the median with a uh, social class? The exact middle of the distribution? You're going to learn this in chapter three, but I can tell you that the exact middle of that distribution would be middle class. Okay. So I can find the median with ordinal level data. Mean, can I find the mean? Can I add the upper class to the middle class to the lower class people? And then divide by 25? No. Why not? Because low and then middle and upper class, there's nothing to add there. So because of that, I can't find the mean. Okay, so if I have ordinal level data, I can find the mode and I can find the median, but I can't find the mean. Now, interval ratio level data, this isn't necessarily the best type of I guess you can say it's the best type of data in the sense that you can use the most amount of statistical procedures, but it's not the best type of data. It's just different data is different. Okay. So with interval ratio level data, I could find all three. You know, I talked about how age is an example of interval ratio level data. Could I find the mode if I had age? Well, yeah, I asked, you know, how many people are, in the class are 18, how many people are 19, how many people are 20. That's typically the case that the mode, at least historically in my classes, have been 20. So I can find the mode. Just say out of the 25 people, 10 people are 20. So that's the mode. So I can find mode. Can I find the median with age? Yes. How would I do it with age? I take the youngest person and I line up everybody based upon their age, till I get to the oldest person, right? So I get the youngest person to the oldest person, find the exact middle of that distribution, and that would be my median. So I can find the mode, I can find the median. Could I find the mean with age? Again, yes I can. What do I do? I add up everybody's age, and I divide by the 25 students in the class, and I would have the average age in the class, so I would have the mean age. So with interval ratio level data, I can find the mean, median, and mode, so I can do all the statistical procedures. So in a sense, that interval ratio level data is the best in the sense that you can do the most amount of statistical procedures. Ordinal level data is kind of somewhere in between. You could do some procedures, but you can't do others. And with nominal level data, you can say that it's the most limited type of data because it's the most it's the most limited type of data in the sense that you could do the least amount of statistical procedures when you have this type of data. Not to say that it's bad data, it's just different data is different, okay? Um, so yeah, so you could reference this chart if you want to. So again, some things to know. Nominal level data, there's a difference between the categories, but as far as like, is one category higher or lower and how much higher you, you can't determine that with ordinal level data you can find there is a clear difference you can determine rank so there is a higher and a lower but you can't tell the difference kind of like they said talk about degree you know the person with the phd has a higher level of education than somebody with the masters 
but we don't know how much higher, right? We don't know how much more time that person spent in school who has a PhD than somebody who has a master's. And with interval ratio level data, you can tell all three. So you can determine there's a difference between the categories. You can tell which one's higher, which one's lower. And you can also measure the diff difference in the sense of like age, you know, you can tell somebody who's 25 is, you know, 20 years younger than somebody who's 45 years old, okay? All right, so let's talk about the last thing for this chapter, which is just some probably just some definition that you, you're gonna wanna remember. So what is a population? So a population is a total set of individuals, objects, groups, or events in which the researcher is interested in. So when you have a population, let's just say I wanna study graduation rates and transfer rates of CRD students. So the population that I'd be interested in is the CRD students. Now, how many students go to CRD? A little bit more than 16,000. Okay. Quite a few. Okay. Now, if let's just say I wanted to study the graduation rates and transfer rates to CRD students, I could because we have a team of statisticians who track all, so we track all this stuff, right? Um, but let's just say that I didn't, for whatever reason, they didn't want to give me access to that. I could pull a sample. So a sample is a small subset selected from a population that usually, we're using the sample to represent the population and based on that sample data, I can infer or make assumptions about the population based upon that sample data, okay? So, and then there's two types of statistics that we're gonna be learning about. The first half of the class, you're gonna be learning about descriptive statistics. The second half, we're gonna be learning about inferential statistics. So descriptive statistics are just procedures that help us to organize and describe the data collected from either a sample or a population. So descriptive statistics sounds like what it is. We're describing the data. We're using some statistical procedure to describe the data that we have. Okay, now this could be either for the population, we might be describing the population, or we could be describing the sample. Now with inferential statistics, these are procedures that we're using to make predictions or assumptions or inferences about the population based upon our sample data. So we pulled a sample from the population because we didn't have access to the whole population. And then we're inferring to the population based upon that sample data. So we're making assumptions about the population based upon that sample data, okay? Uh, so like I said, population, total set of individuals, objects, groups, or events, and which researchers are interested in. We're talking about how COD could be a population, say I'm interested in just COD students, you know, look at the graduation rates and transfer rates of COD students. Now, again, a sample, small subset selected from the population to study, to infer about the population from. Now, how could COD be a sample? Maybe you could use COD as a sample for other community colleges around the region or for the state of California. It wouldn't be a good sample, but you could use it as a sample. Again, now, like I said, descriptive statistics, procedures that help us organize and describe data collected from either a sample or a population. And again, we're just describing what we see when we look at the population. And I think one way to think of, to make it a little bit simpler when you think about descriptive versus inferential statistics, with descriptive statistic, we're just, it sounds like what it is. Descriptive, we are describing the data. With inferential, we are inferring about the population from our sample data. So if you know what inf inferring means, you kind of make an assumption about something based on something else, okay? So you're making an assumption about the population or inferring about the population based upon that sample data. So like I said, inferential statistics are used with making predictions about a population from observations and analyses of the sample. Um, yeah, all right, so anyways, that was chapter one. Like I said, you're probably gonna wanna uh, 
maybe make some flashcards out of this stuff and then re go back through this. A lot of it is, you know, conceptual terminology, definitions. We get into the mathematical stuff later on, you know, starts with chapter two, but right now it's just more kind of laying the groundwork and the framework for understanding statistics, right?